So thank you, everybody, for blowing in from the wind 12 quarters. That's amazing, 24 countries. I appreciate that. And thank you for calling me a very old man. <laughs> uh, so actually, I'm mildly surprised that I'm addressing the topic I'm going to talk to you about, because it's about research. And I'm not really a researcher. I am a clinician, and I dabble in research. I'm a, if you will, a gentleman researcher. Uh, but I guess that gives me a perspective on how useful is the stuff that all you researchers are doing in a clinic. And that's what I guess I'm going to be giving you a perspective on. But I also want to let you know I've changed the title of my talk. I should have told the conference organizers, but what can I say? So I've actually just changed the tense. So it's now what have we been doing and have we been any good at it? Because I'm going to share with you a historical perspective. That's the advantage of being old is that you get the historical perspective because nobody remembers the stuff that went on before except old people like us. So what I'm going to do here is break down the history of research into the effectiveness of genetic counseling into three historical periods. I'm going to give you a historical narrative. There are many other historical narratives that you can choose. Mine are, is very arbitrary and idiosyncratic, but it's the right one. <laughs> so first, you want to ask the basic question, what is genetic counseling? So as, as Anna uh, politely pointed out, I've been a practicing genetic counselor now since 1983 and was involved with genetics research for several years before that. I was once the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Genetic Counseling. I was part of the committee that crafted the modern definition of genetic counseling back in 2005 with Barb Biesecker. Uh, I've been on the editorial board of the American Journal of Medical Genetics for 20 years, and I've written about genetic counseling in the professional literature and on the DNA Exchange blog. And I tell you this not to impress you with what I've done, but rather to say I thought a lot about what is genetic counseling and, and how effective is it. And honestly, I haven't the foggiest notion. <laughs> I'm still not sure what genetic counseling is or what it's trying to do or how to measure its effectiveness. I right? think I'm going to sing, make me want to holler the way they do my life. <laughs> I think I just regretted signing the thing that you can video this. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> that was an unplanned. Uh, <laughs> Marvin Gaye impression. <laughs> but anyway, it's very confusing to me. This is really what genetic counseling is, you, the things that you can find on the internet. So I'm a genetic counselor. I solve problems you don't know you have in ways you can't understand. You're welcome. <laughs> That's the end of my talk, because we don't know what's going on. Have a cup of coffee, everybody, or a beer, and let's move on. So three phases of genetic counseling. Phase one. 1947 to 1981, and we were listening on eight tracks to the Beatles during a good portion of that time frame, just trying to give you some outside perspective here. And at that point, we were looking mostly at reproductive outcomes and avoiding disability. And then there's phase two, which was, I put it, 1982 to 1995, and you'll see the reasons why I choose these years as cutoffs, where we were still talking about reproduction, but also got into anxiety and patient recall and patient expectations. And now, starting November 1st, 1996, to, uh, to October 4th today, because it'll change after, say, after you've heard all these wonderful talks, uh, about, there's a much wider range of measures of looking at the effectiveness of genetic counseling. So let's start with phase one, because that would make sense. So phase one, we start at 1947. And I always apologize up front. I should have, for my New York speeds. I grew up in New York, and I speak in New York speed. I'll try and slow it down for those of you who speak with a different accent at slower rates. But 1947 is when that er genetic counselor, Sheldon Reed, gave us the, that succinct and terse definition of genetic counseling as a kind of genetic social work. And you know, that really does still kind of capture what we do. And even though it's more of a description than a definition, it, it sort of captures our essence, I think, or what we're trying to do. He really didn't tell us what the goals and the methods were, but it is arguably the earliest formal acknowledgement of the importance of the psychosocial aspect of genetic counseling. Right? He didn't say it's about genetic, it's about genetic social work. By the way, there's a picture of Sheldon Reed and his wife, Elizabeth, who actually uh, was on, they published several things together. But the times being what they were, she couldn't rise to the, quite the prominence that he did. So formal genetic counseling at this time, in this rough time period, was practiced within the context of the field of medical genetics, and mostly by MDs and PhDs. And although everybody liked to pretend we were no longer eugenicists, we swore off it after World War II, 
In fact, the eugenic influences were still there, we just called it something different. It didn't have a race-based eugenics, but clearly the, 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 there were still the widths of it were still in the air. So the implicit and sometimes explicit goal of genetic counseling during this time was to improve the genetic health of the population. And here is a picture of uh, Jim Neal, one of the founding figures of medical genetics at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. And here's the book that recaptures his life. Physician to the gene pool. Not physician to patients, not to families, but to the gene pool. You've got to take care of that gene pool out there, be it the Yanomamo where he studied, or in, uh, he studied the Yanomamo Indians, be it in Japan after the to study the effects of the radiation bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or in the US in the clinic. And well, no, Jim Neal was just one guy, so who else was out there saying what genetic counseling is? So let's look at Nash Herndon, who founded what was arguably the first medical genetics clinic uh, in, the, in the US at Bowman Gray in the late 1930s, early 1940s. And generally, advice concerning heredity that is sound and advantageous to the individual family will also be sound and advantageous for society as a whole. So, you know, we're not going to tell them what to do, but if you educate them properly, they'll do the right thing. At this level, and this is Robert Murray here, was another major figure in uh, genetics in the 60s and beyond. At this level, then, counseling tends to have the desired effect. That is to encourage low-risk families to have more offspring and to discourage high-risk families from having more offspring. Not that we're being directive or anything, but... <laughs> or Lee Dice uh, from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. Uh, human heredity actually is a phase of public health. The heredity of the population should be at least as much concerned to each commonwealth as our infectious diseases. Or our founder, Sheldon Reed. It could be stated as a principle that the mentally sound will voluntarily carry out a eugenics program which is acceptable to society if counseling and genetics is available to them. So obviously these are just anecdotal quotes, but I think they capture the spirit of what was being done at this time. So how good were we at influencing people's reproductive outcomes? And anybody who's done reproductive counseling is kind of thinking up front, I mean, I don't influence people to have babies. They're already pregnant when I'm seeing them, most of them. Uh, so the earliest study that I could find that measures the success of genetic counseling, and let me start out by saying when you say the earliest, you're always wrong. There's always somebody somewhere who did something earlier. That's the whole thing about history is you always find somebody earlier. So if you know somebody earlier, then it's fine. I accept it. I'm wrong. But I'd be real interested in finding that study, so let me know. But that was Cedric Carter down in London. And this was a publication in 1967 called Comments on Genetic Counseling from the Proceedings of the Third International Conference on Human Genetics. And he was looking at the effects of genetic counseling at the hospital for sick children in London. And he just said, after the counseling, two-thirds of the high-risk families were deterred from further pregnancies. And in low-risk families, 75% went on to have additional pregnancies. So overall, the relative proportions of the two groups deciding to have or not have further children indicate that the parents have made responsible decisions. So, you know, it's not really about the patients. It's about, gee, what's the effect on society? Now, many of you may know Jerry Evers Kaibooms, who's been a researcher in, uh, in Belgium for many, many decades now. And in the late 70s, 1977, she and her co-author, Vanderberg, uh, said, all right, let's look at all the studies that have been published in the 1970s on the effectiveness of genetic counseling. So even though this is, these people were saying, let's look at the public health, what was actually happening in, these, in the research studies that, that addressed these questions. And she found 22 studies published in this six-year period. So 1977, that's three decades after Sheldon Reed first came up with the definition of genetic counseling. And she found that the studies focused on three areas. How well people understood the particular disease and the recurrence risk, their decisions concerning further pregnancies or other alternatives, which we, I guess, think about as not having babies or having a donor or things like that, or changes in family planning composition after genetic counseling, like, will I have more babies or more boys or things along those lines. So to quote, uh, the effect of genetic counseling upon understanding of the hereditary nature of the disease and remembering the recurrence risk differs widely 
And I think we could all agree with that, and that's still true 30-something years later, because they walk out of the office and say something, and you think, were you sitting in the same room as me? Uh, about one half of the counselees considered themselves influenced by genetic counseling in reaching a decision on family planning. And the proportion of affected children born after genetic counseling corresponded more or less to the expected proportions. So the authors speculated that the relatively recent introduction of amniocentesis may encourage parents to have more children. You've got to remember that was the 1970s. Right? So to quote again from the authors of this review article, genetic counseling, if adequately available to families at risk, allow them to plan in responsible freedom and can thus be a powerful tool in the fight against the burden genetic diseases impose on individuals in society. And by the way, this is not a criticism. This is the appropriate, this is the, the tenor of the times. So I'm not saying what they were doing is wrong. I'm not trying to impose a retrospective historical judgment. People will look at what I've written over time and say, wow, was he out of whack? You know, he just wasn't connecting. Can you believe the unethical stuff he's done? In fact, they're already saying that, but that's another story. <laughs> so genetic counseling was primarily during this period a medical activity that focused on reproduction. Success was primarily measured as avoidance of disability. And prenatal diagnosis was seen as a means of achieving this end, potentially more effective than just educating parents about hereditary risks. So instead of scaring them into not having kids or encouraging them to have more, we can offer them amniocentesis, and that may affect their decisions. And if you think amnio wasn't introduced with the idea of, of reducing disability, if you think it was introduced to give people choice, you're wrong. And here's a quote that proves my point, because I ignored all the quotes that just prove my point. We are less certain about, the, this is from an early publication, 1973, from Lancet, uh, looking at uh, their, their amniocentesis program. And looking at, gee, who, is it worth it cost-benefit? We are less certain about the balance and costs of amniocentesis at current rates of screening the whole pregnant population. In other words, should we be offering amnio to everybody? But is a detailed estimate of the costs required? The lifelong care of severely retarded persons is so burdensome in almost every human dimension that no preventive program is likely to outweigh the burden. And remember here, they're probably talking about Down syndrome, because that's what you're screening for at this point. You know, we're not talking trisomy 18 or tay sachs disease, although those are sort of in the wings. In fact, you probably couldn't even diagnose uh, tay sachs prenatally in those days. But I will also say it wasn't all about reproduction. There were people who were thinking, you know, there are, there are psychosocial aspects going on here. That's a picture of Henry Lynch, by the way. Uh, and Henry uh, was actually on the author, was the, uh, the author on some of the early articles from the 1960s about the importance of psychological aspects of genetic counseling. Uh, and I've listed two of them here if you want to go back to your, when you go back and look them up. They're pretty interesting and sophisticated. But uh, the, the whole family concept in clinical genetics, psychosocial factors in families with a disfiguring genetic fault, the Journal of Psychosomatics, American Journal of Disease of the Children. This is, you know, 1964, 65. People were thinking about the psychological aspects, too. It just wasn't a major factor in measuring the success of genetic counseling. Ah, uh, yes. This is, you, many of you may be familiar with this or are old enough. This is the first definition of genetic counseling formed by the American Society of Human Genetics. I have to say, I never read it through. Because <laughs> it's like so long, and you kind of like forget it halfway through what you read earlier. And then it's like the classic definition by committee. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's kind of actually not a bad definition in the sense of that it, it communicates what we are still trying to do for the most part. But it's, it was just too long and complicated. But despite that definition, which really doesn't talk anything at all about reducing the incident of disability, the measures of success weren't using this definition. Right? They weren't looking at, gee, can they choose a course of action which seems appropriate to them in light of their ethical, religious, and et cetera uh, uh, factors. So we had the definition, but what, we were, what they were doing was somewhat different than what the definition said, or what they were measuring in success more precisely. And also around 19, in the that time, late 70s, early 80s, they kind of realized there's somebody else in the room besides the gene pool and the doctor. There's actually a patient in there who has a psychological uh, inner life. And here we have to thank uh, uh, Clark Fraser and the wonderful Abby Littman. There's Abby there, still rabble-rousing. 
uh, in Montreal. Uh, this is a fairly recent picture of her. I think that's the, the McGill feminist anarchist block at, at a march, uh, which makes perfect sense if you know Abby. But she, she and, and Clark Frazier uh, produced these three publications in the American Journal of Medical Genetics that were really among the earliest and first and best psychosocial studies, psychological studies of the way genetic counselees are uh, perceiving the whole affair. So what she did, a quick review of this, for those of you who have never read it, and if you haven't, you can't call yourself a genetic counselor until you've read these studies, I'm sorry, even if you've passed your boards. But it was a qualitative study of 30 genetic counseling sessions. And she said, all right, how did patients understand and react to genetic counseling information? We sit there yapping at them all this time for an hour long explaining obscure statistics. W what kind of sense are they making of this? And conclusions here, we're going to go to another slide or two on this. This analysis of counselees perceptions of the problems created by being at genetic risk that parents may process the disparate facts of their situations in common ways that emphasize their uncertainty. And it indicates that how parents perceive factual information may be more important in orienting their deliberations than what these facts actually are. So it makes no difference what you say to them, it's how they process it that really matters. And they're all gonna process it in unique ways and I think this is, this is still true today. You could do this study today, and you would come up with the exact same conclusion. Patients often perceive risks as dichotomous. Either it's going to happen or it ain't going to happen, whether that risk is 1 in 100, 1 in 10,000, or, or, or actually 1 in 2. It's, it's either or. This information is perceived qualitatively, not quantitatively. And then they develop coping mechanisms, inferring from their factual mechanisms and personal experience to justify their reproductive choices. So most of them decided what they were going to do before they met us, and they just take that information to justify their decision. Sometimes we influence it, but I think Abby's point was we influence it a lot less often than we think we do. Another important person during this time starting to emerge was my good friend Seymour Kessler. And there's Seymour down there on the lower right. And Seymour is still alive, or as he says, I'm still above the sod, Bob, <laughs> uh, but no longer practicing genetic counseling. But uh, he, he published a review article, one of his important uh, articles on the psychological aspects of genetic counseling, uh, called the psychological, well, actually, the first one was not in that group, the psychological paradigm shift in genetic counseling, and then the second one, uh, the psychological aspects of genetic counseling, analysis of a transcript. These were, he was saying, hey, this is all in their heads, guys. It's not in your heads, it's in their heads. Uh, whoops, that skipped a few. Did it? No, I think it ah, we can end it there for the moment. So, so we go from phase one to phase two. So what's going on in the background at this time? Well, there's a waning of the traditional physician-centered model of medicine and the emergence of a model of patient-centered care and patient's rights. There's also an expansion of genetics clinics in the US. In 1955, there were about a dozen genetics clinics in the US. By 1980, there were 327. I'm sorry, I couldn't find similar figures for other places around the world. They're probably out there, but I couldn't find them. And we saw significant growth of the genetic counseling profession, widespread availability of prenatal diagnosis, maternal serum screening, ultrasonography. Very importantly, social scientists and psychologists started to become involved with genetic counseling research, some of whom may even be in this room. And these are just names of, the art of authors of articles that happened to be in front of me while I was preparing that slide. There are many other people who are equally important. And also, unrelated to genetics, but important for the whole field of psychological research, was the work of Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, uh, from, initially from Israel, they eventually moved to the US, on the whole field of psychological research starting in the 1970s. And Abby Littman said to me, it was their research that said, when she read that, she said, oh, this is what I got to apply to genetic counseling. It was also starting to be a shift in the focus of assessing the effectiveness of genetic counseling. And here's why I use 1982. This was the first large-scale prospective study of GC, of genetic counseling. I don't know how that beer wound up in the picture. It's probably just for scale. You know. But uh, this was Jim Sorensen's classic study. Uh, and I'll, I'll make it a little, that's, that's what it looks like. Uh, but this is, for those who want to read it, that's the actual, there's a title, a little bit easier to read it that way. And at the time, Dr. Sorensen was a sociologist at Boston University School of Public Health, the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences. And incidentally, he died earlier this year. So it's an important passing. 
So we're going to go over this study in a little bit of detail because of the important issues it raises. So he said, all right, let's look at what's been published so far. A review of the study suggests that the criteria most consistently used by genetic counselors to evaluate the success of their work are the level of client medical genetic knowledge post-counseling, and secondarily, gee, what are their reproductive intentions? To our knowledge, no effort has been made to identify the questions and concerns clients bring to counseling, knowledge that should be very useful in designing services that meet professional and client criteria of effective counseling. So 1982, that's what, 35 years? Am I adding that right? After Sheldon Reed came up with it, it was like, oh yeah, that's, what do they want out of this? And this is actually stunning that he pulled this study off. This is before the internet, before computers were widely available. There were 2,200 genetic counseling clients, and he specifically used the word clients, from 47 clinics in 25 states in the US. There were 205 different genetic professionals conducting the counseling, and that was MDs, PhDs, master's levels, nurses, et cetera. They gave surveys prior to genetic counseling, just after it, one week later, and six months later and also 190 interviews conducted at 12 different clinics. I mean, that, that's stunning. They only looked at the female responders because there were too few males. I'm going to come back to that point at the end of my talk. And he looked at three topics. What, what concerns and questions do clients bring to counseling? And how much do we meet those needs? How effective are we in educating them? And how effective are we in impacting their reproductive decisions? The most common concerns of clients prior to genetic counseling, here you can see listed here, etiology, recurrence risk, treatment, things most of us who are practicing genetic counseling would say, yeah, that's pretty much what patients bring in, into the door when they sit in our clinics. Then the genetic, then what was the, how effective were genetic counselors in assessing what patients' expectations were? And 75% of counselors correctly identified recurrence risk as important. Only 43 identified prognosis as important. And of all the other client concerns, less than a third of genetic counselors anticipated that's what clients wanted out of it. And it made no difference what your degree was or how many years of experience. So how good were they at affecting the impact on these things six months afterwards? About 20% of patients actually recall recurrence risk. And I thought that was on the high side, personally. 27% uh, inaccurately uh, recall their recurrence risk. And 54%, no recurrence risk was given to them, even though that was their primary concern for going in there. And interestingly, the higher the risk a client believed was involved, the less likely she was, was to have learned the actual risk. So if she went in there thinking it was high, she came out thinking it was high. How about reproductive plans? Well, most clients didn't change their reproductive plans. <laughs> Uh, those who were most likely to change were those who were uncertain prior to pregnancy and felt they were now more likely to have children. So people who really didn't know who were really lost, those are the ones we can probably help the most if this is their primary concern. And those who were most likely to change their plans were those who felt the counselor addressed their primary concerns. So if we listen to them and address their, what they said to us, then they'll say, hey, that was a useful experience. To the question, is genetic counseling effective, we would respond, there is no simple answer. Rather, the answer or answers are situationally bound and must be addressed in terms of understanding why counseling is sought, the objectives of its providers, what the service consists of, and how it impacts on its recipients. An overall assessment must point to the fact that counseling has been effective for many clients, but ineffective or irrelevant for almost equal number. In general, while counselors do a fair job of discussing medical questions that clients bring to counseling, they do a poor job of discussing socio-medical issues and problems. For clients, these issues and concerns are neither trivial nor peripheral, and that's an understatement. Okay. All right, so quickly moving along again here. Old Seymour Kessler comes back to, uh, uh, to us again, and he performed a similar lit review in the 1980s as part of his uh, psychological aspects of genetic counseling. And that's a plug for the book, and I make the plug because I was the editor of that book. Uh, so what he found in looking at the literature published after Jerry Evers Kaiboom, uh, education is reasonably effective regarding diagnosis and recurrence risk, but there's room for improvement. That patient recall deteriorated over time. Educational priorities and agendas of counselors and counselees are not always in agreement. So it's not just a Sorensen study that finds it, but a literature review. We have a poor understanding of how cognitive processes distort information and use it for decision making. 
we don't have a strong impact on reproductive decisions. And although clients may claim that genetic counseling influenced their plans, in reality, their intentions were often the same before as after counseling. He also said there are very many different methodologies, so it's difficult to compare effectiveness across the different studies. So let's look at a, another study done. I get some of these slides to get more interesting eventually, I promise. Uh, but this, I think, was the best, the best first study to look at the sophisticated process from a statistical standpoint of what goes into clients' decisions. This is from Petra Fretz uh, in, uh, in Holland. Uh, and this is a, pub, a, journal, a study published in 1990, the American <laughs> Journal of Medical Genetics and looked at 164 couples several years after genetic counseling. And they found eight factors that correctly identified reproductive decisions. Did the family think that they were gonna have any more kids anyway? Did they want three kids and they had three kids, so B, what's the big deal? Did they interpret the risk as high? Did they interpret the risk as low and moderate? Also, if the risk was less than 5% and they had no children, that we were more likely to influence their uh, reproductive decisions, or they're more likely to change their reproductive decisions. So you're more likely to have a kid if you felt the risk was low and you didn't have any kids, and that kind of makes sense. And people who had a strong desire to have kids still had a strong desire to have kids after counseling, and if there was decisive prenatal diagnosis. And when you do multifactorial studies, if you put these last three together, if you see, perceive the disorder as severe, if prenatal diagnosis is available, if they have no children and they're young, then they're more likely to have kids after genetic counseling. Now, the whole world wasn't reproduction. There was still some stuff involved uh, with non-reproduction, like Huntington's disease. For those of you who remember DNA linkage for doing Huntington studies, uh, that's a, a totally different uh, ball of wax. By the way, my, uh, my argument is that there are more publications about Huntington's than actual Huntington's tests. <laughs> uh, it's like if you, if you didn't know anything about genetic counseling, just looked at literature, you would think that we all did Huntington studies all day long. <laughs> Nothing against these studies. They're wonderful, and they really gave great insight, but... Uh, but prior to this, most studies on genetic counseling on, on Huntington's focused on how genetic counseling influenced the incidence of Huntington's. But now research shifted from only reproduction to decision making about testing, risk perception, family dynamics, the role of spouses, psychological stress. So we're starting to look at other things. And then uh, from here in the UK in the, in the 90s, there were two articles written by Ruth Chadwick and Angus Clark back and forth, not really research studies, but saying how do you measure the effectiveness of genetic, of genetic counseling. And Ruth, among other things, argued that, gee, it might be okay to look at reproductive outcomes if parents are making, making choices that they feel are appropriate, that after genetic counseling influenced it in a way that they thought was useful. And Angus Clark wrote back and said, ah, public health, uh, that shouldn't be an acceptable goal. And I don't know who was right or who was wrong. Here, here are the references for those who ever want to look them if you haven't looked at them. They're, they're, they're like two or three pages, so they're easy to read. Uh, but uh, ultimately, the point here is that not that who was right or wrong, Chadwick or Angus Clark, but rather that genetic counseling has more goals than worrying about the genetic health of the population. They both agreed on that. The question was whether or not we should continue to use that as part of the effectiveness. All right, so we go to phase three. And the reason this slide is here is so we can see a picture of my granddaughter. <laughs> That's her instructing me on how to use my iPhone. <laughs> and my excuse for having her picture in here is that the shift went from uh, focusing on having babies to older people like me and more common diseases. You could at least say, ah, <laughs> isn't she cute? <laughs> I think so. Uh, this is a, I like this slide because it gives an idea of how genetic counseling has branched out over time. So genetic counseling sort of grew out of medical genetics, which started as early, yeah, I'm pointing here, you can't see what I'm pointing at, that's why they have these pointers here somewhere. Ah, is that, ah, that's, I bet that's a, no, that's a pen. Oh, well, anyway, you can see up there, medical genetics up there, 1930. Genetic counseling profession breaking off around 1970 or so when Sarah Lawrence uh, had its first graduates. And then you can see the various ways that genetic counselors have branched off into different areas in genetic counseling. So going up to, you know, up to now, common diseases would be the most recent. And I had to put the psychiatry in because Janine Austin is here, and she would yell at me if I didn't include that. <laughs> it wasn't a yell. But this gives you some idea of, gee, we're expanding out now. We're not just thinking about babies. And we're working with other specialists. The reason I use November, 19, November 1st, 1996 as the start here 
is that's when uh, Myriad introduced BRCA testing on a commercial basis. So the BRCA1 gene was first identified in 1994, but in terms of incorporating that result into clinical practice, it was November, for, actually I don't know it's November 1st and nobody at Myriad can remember the exact date other than November, so I'm arbitrarily calling it November 1st, 1996. Uh, they launched their, their full uh, BRCA analysis. Not quite so full in retrospect, but what was thought to be full at the time. So this opened up like a whole new world. This is like not dealing with babies and pregnant women and, and, and worrying about people who, are gonna get, who have or are going to get adult onset diseases that maybe we can impact somehow. But what else is happening besides that introduction? Well, there was completion of the Human Genome Project. The dropping cost of genetic testing, you know, in the U.S., you can get a multi-gene panel for two or three hundred dollars these days, which is, I don't know, 200 pounds or something like that. I don't know what the conversion rate, no, if it goes to the conversion rate I have, it's like about 50 pounds. Uh, widespread availability of genetic testing for many conditions. A formal separation of genetic counselors in the U.S. from medical geneticists. 1992, basically, genetic counselors seceded, not so voluntarily, from the American College of Medical Genetics to form the American College of Genetic Counseling. So we basically, going back to that slide where you saw us branching off, we went on a dating spree. We said, hey, good, you don't want us so much, we'll, we'll go to the neurologists and the obstetricians and the oncologists and the surgeons, and we'll expand. It was really, the, in the US, the best thing that ever happened in the profession. The Journal of Genetic Counseling debuted in 1992. And of course, the new definition of genetic counseling, which was actually formed in 2005, but published in 2006, Oh yeah, this is gonna get Barb mad, but. Uh, so that's our definition there that we, many of you, have, I'm sure have this memorized. I will say it's certainly terser than the, um, than the American Society of Human Genetics definition, but not altogether different. Uh, I was recently contacted by a genetic counselor who said she thought that this should be added to this definition, and there's mixed feelings about this, but I'm interested in what the audience thinks. We should include care coordination and provision of resources to increase appropriate access to genetic testing as well as other health care and support services. Is that scope of practice? Is it a definition? I don't know, but it's a, an interesting thought to think about. Should the definition be changed? Is the definition getting a little bit old and rusty? I don't know, but we should, you as a profession, you young people need to be thinking about that. Okay. Uh, but we now actually studies were using this definition to, to look at the effectiveness of genetic counseling. So studies are saying, hey, this is what genetic counseling should be. How does our study meet those criteria? And we now have a whole range of different measures of effectiveness. And I'm going to mention just some of them. Some of them we'll hear about the conference. Some of these were developed by some of you in the audience. And if I left out somebody's favorite measure, it's not personal. We can only fit so many slides in this talk here. But certainly one of the key ones was uh, Shoshi Shiloh's uh, study on perceived personal control, uh, which is a, an <coughs> personal control is the belief that one has at one's disposal a response that can influence the aversiveness of an event. So do I have the power to, okay, deal with this and change with it and cope with it? And there can be behavioral control. You can do things about it. Cognitive control. You can understand it in a way, in a, in a way that you can, uh, so it's not mastering you, you're mastering it. Uh, and decisional control. I can do things to af affect it. It's a simple nine-item questionnaire. It's been used in, it's validated, used in several study, in studies in multiple countries. How else do we do it? So. Uh, we do have, of course, a genetic counseling outcome scale produced here in the UK and designed to measure decisional control, cognitive control, behavioral control, emotional regulation, hope, drawing to some extent from Shoshi Shilohs, who was part of the study that uh, produced this. Uh, we look at patient satisfaction uh, with cancer genetic counseling services. This is a genetic counseling satisfaction, satisfaction scale. I think they're at, uh, uh, at, uh, in D.C., uh, the reciprocal engagement model, uh, Pat McCarthy Veach uh, and Bonnie Leroy in, in Minnesota are, are soon to be outgoing editor of Journal of Genetic Counseling. Uh, they've, looked, they've actually used it in clinical practice to say, okay, how effective is this model? Uh, family communication, that's another important thing to think about. Okay, we want them to tell their family about this result. How good are we about it? Do the families follow up? Uh, we're looking at uh, anxiety, risk perception. By the way, anxiety to me, as a measure, everybody's anxious. Of course they're anxious. I mean, and of course they don't remember anything. I think knowledge, recall, and anxiety personally are terrible measures. And I think I haven't even done my job. I haven't gotten them anxious. And if they're not confused, walking out of my office. Right? Uh, uh, so they're looking at uh, not only in, 
in reproduction, but in cancer. Right? Uh, health, looking at impact on health behaviors and disease prevention. Uh, this is a randomized study I was involved in that looked at genetic counseling and testing for surgical intervention in women at high risk of ovarian cancer. So we recruited women from mammography clinics, and we told them, hey, you're at high risk for ovarian cancer, never mind this mammogram that you just had. And we looked at whether or not it affected their uptake of BRCA testing and uh, having a risk-reducing salpingo oophorectomy. And we kind of influenced it. Um, I put these references up, not here to go over them in detail, but to show you that there is actually some statistical support or published report or support of what I'm saying here, and you can look these studies up. Barb uh, Bisek was favorite, adaptation uh, as a measure of success of genetic counseling. Okay. Uh, cost savings, right? At first you want to cringe, but you know, we should be able to say, okay, this is how much it's costing to do this, and this is what you're getting out of it. There can be, we're not necessarily trying to save money, but we should be showing how that money is being used appropriately. I don't think it's an ultimate measure, but an important ancillary measure. And we still are impacting on, uh, looking at the impact on disability and disease, doing it in more sophisticated ways, like Ruth Cowan's study on thalassemia screening on the island of Cyprus, where they actually engaged the entire community before they established a screening program. They talked to everybody and said, well, should we do this, and how do you want it done? So we do have a whole bunch of ways of measuring the effectiveness. So when I think about studies that are trying to measure effectiveness, what questions do I ask? Well, the classic who, what, when, where, why. So who is measuring the effectiveness of counseling? Are they physicians? Are they genetic counselors? Are they health economists? Each one is going to bring a different agenda. What are their justifications for using a particular measure? Are they just doing it because they're trying to show cost effectiveness? They're trying to impact reproduction? You know, tell us why you use this outcome measure. When are they performing the study? As, you mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, the 1970s, effectiveness is quite different than if we measured it now. Or if you did a study on the effectiveness of genetic counseling on insurance about, uh, excuse, about anxiety about health insurance, and you did that before the, the US law of GINA and versus after the US law of GINA. GINA is a law in the US that says health insurance can't be used as a pre existing condition. And we think that's still kind of true in the US, but we have a lot of fake truth in the US, so I don't know what's true anymore. Uh, but those historical factors obviously affect it. I mean, do you effect on reproduction before or after amniocentesis is available for this particular condition. Where is the study being performed? Effectiveness in Cyprus or in Saudi Arabia or in England or it might be very different than in, in the United States. And why are they trying to measure effectiveness? What, what's their motivating factors here? Those questions that you should be asking when you're looking at these studies. And overall, what's my assessment on how effective are we? I'd say, eh. We're not particularly good at preventing disability. There's generally high patient satisfaction. They like us. They laugh at our jokes. There's at least a temporary increase in patient anxiety and risk perception, usually a transient increase in anxiety. There's exceptions. This is just generalizations. There's some improvement in sense of control. We can help to some extent with adherence to medical behaviors and perhaps reduce the incidence of some diseases, uh, especially in cancer. I mean, risk-reducing sapingo, ephrectomy, and mastectomy do reduce the incidence of these diseases. They're not inappropriate decisions for many patients. Yeah. It's not clear if genetic counseling by genetic counselors. By the way, all you UK people, I did my best to spell it the wrong way all this time. <laughs> but you know, the, the goddamn autocorrect changes it every time, and then you lose track, and then you're quoting, and when you quote, you have to do it in the original spelling. So I'm sorry or if you're offended on any of the misspellings I messed up here. But anyway, it's not clear if genetic counseling by genetic counselors is any more effective than genetic counseling delivered by other healthcare providers, uh, by videos, or by decision aids. The jury is still out on that, at least in the studies. I know in our hearts we believe we're better, but we really don't know that. It probably doesn't matter too much if genetic counseling is conducted in person, or through a telephone, or through a, uh, or through a, 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 tele a computer connection. I'm drawing a blank on the word. Uh, and today's measurements may not be considered appropriate measures in the future. You know, we've got to keep on changing these things. So what affects the scope and goals of genetic counseling? Well, technological advances. Right? We couldn't do a study on amnio in the 1960s because we didn't have amnio. We couldn't do BRCA studies until 1996. The dropping cost of genetic testing. We're no longer the gatekeepers. You know, we used to be the gatekeepers because genetic testing was thousands of dollars and trying to figure out which was the right test took forever. 
But now, yeah, you take a panel, relatively inexpensive, you throw it against the wall, you see what spaghetti sticks, and then you have your answers in many cases, especially in cancer. Uh, there are changing attitudes towards disability. I think, although I wouldn't say there's wide-scale acceptance, it's certainly improved over time. There's the availability, at least for now, of safe legal abortion, always up in the air. Uh, changing demographics, immigration, migration, age structure of the population, reproductive rates, all these are going to affect the scope and the goals of genetic counseling. There's going to be local, unique, historical, cultural, and socioeconomic factors. And of course, the definition will change over time. But please wait till I'm retired, so I'm not offended that my definition is no longer the accepted one. What challenges do we have ahead? Well, most genetic counseling will be delivered by non-genetic specialists who may have very different agendas than genetic counselors. Right? We no longer do it all. Everybody and their brother is doing genetic counseling. And whether we like it or not, there will be more direct-to-consumer genetic testing without genetic counseling, at least beforehand. And even afterwards, lots of them don't follow up so far. Still, more counseling will take place post-testing. Just think about the idea of the paired somatic and germline testing for all cancer patients. Now that G was starting to guide cancer treatment by DNA sequencing of the tumor, and oh, by the way, we're picking up uh, germline mutations, we're going to be doing genetic counseling on every cancer patient, maybe? If not every, lots of them? Is that really going to go through genetic counselors? There will also be fewer genetic counselors in clinical positions and a wider scope of of a practice for genetic counselors. And we'll be looking at the effectiveness of genetic counseling versus the effectiveness of genetic counselors, two important distinctions. But in the US, 25% of the workforce now works for laboratories. So I think we can't ignore their important contributions to what we should be doing and how we measure the effectiveness of the profession. There will be new genetic tests that will raise questions that are not askable today. There will be changes in social attitudes towards a whole bunch of things, including genetic counselors. There will be greater global availability of genetic tests and genetic counselors. So we are still a growing profession. And also, I have to keep on hammering this one home. Genetic test testing does not equal genetic counseling. For some of us, it's not part of our job. For some of us, it's an important part of our job. But for none of us, it's not all that we do. We're not out there to sell genetic tests. We're not out there to test everybody. We're out there to counsel them, and if they have testing and it's about testing, that's great. We, we're going to have to continue to develop and enhance our counseling skills if we want to study the effectiveness of genetic counseling. We can't use test uptake as a measure of effectiveness, in my view. Genetic testing and counseling has always been women and children first, and women and children have largely been the guinea pigs of genetic testing, if you think about it. I'll bet 90% of all genetic tests up to now have been on women and kids. Whereas the great uh, writer, Gene Kerr, who wrote, Please Don't Eat the Daisy, said, the only reason they, save, they say women and children first is to test the strength of the lifeboats. Right? So we need really to better incorporate all genders into clinical service and research. And I might add the profession, but that seems to be a really difficult thing to do. Some challenges, other challenges ahead. Widespread acceptance of NIPT and expanded carrier screening is actually, if not intentionally, very compatible with the earlier goals of eliminating disability. Why are we offering this testing to everybody for so many conditions? Not saying that these are bad things to do, but you can see how the disability community is very uneasy with these things in light of the history of the profession. They have very good reason to suspect our motives. And if you think about it, why has there been so little research about the utility of prenatal testing beyond pregnancy termination? We all say, oh yes, you have a choice of having a testing or not having a testing or psychological adaptation, it helps the family. We have no idea. Almost no research has been done on whether or not prenatal testing really helps people. If you have knowledge of Down syndrome prenatally, we don't know if that really helps them, either medically or emotionally or psychologically. So the question to me is, not that it may not do that, it may very well, but why hasn't anybody researched it? It sort of says a lot about what the goals of prenatal diagnosis really have been. And we also have to be careful in thinking when we try to put labels of eugenics on people who are trying to undergo disability. 
I don't think p parents are seeking perfection. I think they're seeking reassurance. So it's not that they want the perfect baby, but I think they want to be reassured that overall we don't see certain problems in the baby. But you know, if you look at some of the uh, advertisements from the labs uh, and other places that offer testing, uh, clinics even, uh, here's some quotes. You know, we're applying revolutionary technology in ways to improve the health, the health of families. Right? Just going back to the early, harking back to the health of society, is the heart of our lab's mission. So it's not, gee, are we going to help them adapt? We're going to improve their health. Or in this one, the goal of prenatal, this is from a lab, prevention. We can screen for all of these mostly severe childhood onset diseases, which is not necessarily a bad goal, but you can see how it harks back to our earlier concerns, first eugenics many years ago, and then the earlier years of genetic counseling and medical genetics. So the ideal genetic counselor, uh, being an expert in many different disciplines at once, exists only as a concept that was written in 1965, which is still true. And to close out my talk and give five minutes, if you have questions about the future of genetic counseling, don't ask me, ask Clara, <laughs> who's going to give the talk on Friday about the future of research in genetic counseling. So show up and then, and you'll find out what's going to happen compared to what we've done. So thank you. Whew. So we've got about four minutes for questions. So please, somebody raise a question or so. Ten minutes, actually, even though it says, oh, you gave me, oh, so we have ten, oh, that's my 15 minutes, oh, very good. So we have about ten minutes for questions, so somebody's got to disagree with me. So who wants to be the, we have roving microphones? Yeah, we do, yes. yeah. So who has a question? Raise your hand. Can I ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask them, get them going. So something's been on my mind for quite a while, and that's trying to package up the magic of what genetic counselling is and sell it to our... Um, health professional colleagues, because we know that genomics is being mainstreamed on a massive scale, and as you say, most of the genetic testing that's being ordered is not being processed through genetic counselling. So if you were going to give a sound bite or a summary sentence of what the magic is, of what genetic counselling is, what would you say? That's a good point. Let me ponder that for a moment and take a sip of water while I come up with an answer. Ah... <laughs> uh. I would say that from a real practical standpoint, the test, if, if your concern is genetic testing, then if you have a genetic counselor involved, your patients will get A, the most satisfaction, the best interpretation, and use that in the most effective way possible to improve either their personal health or to make reproductive decisions. We don't have the data to back that, but we can tell them, go look at the literature, it's out there because they'll never read it. But you can say, up to now, the research has shown. <laughs> uh, how does that for an answer? That sound, uh, that, as a, as a, uh, is, well, is that, if you're is talking, that how you sell it? Is that how, you know, when you're trying to convince? Yeah. Uh, probably, or it depends on who I'm talking to. If you're talking to my department bosses, I save you money. Or I bring in income. Mm. Right? So I think I have different answers for different people. Because mm. they're all looking for something different out of me. Mm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Yes. Can you identify yourself? Yes, I'm uh, Chris Patch from the UK. Yes, that is her. I mean, she's not yes. lying. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, it's more a reflection about my concerns, in a way, being of a similar age perhaps to yourself. Um, a big part of our original role, when we could do very little, was supporting and enabling families to live with the consequences of their rare inherited, truly genetic diseases. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day of this genomic revolution, we will still have those families who mm -hmm. don't choose to have those genetic diseases, who are living with their, the consequences of those genetic diseases over their lifespan. And there is a role for genetic counselling as an act in mm -hmm. that. Right. I'm not particularly concerned who does it, mm -hmm. but I want the people that are doing it to do it well. Um, and the challenge is to still keep that on the agenda, because right. the focus is on the upfront business. Right. You know, I'm I work for Genomics England. A big piece of my work at the moment is considering consent models. Yeah. It's front-loaded. But the reality is the relevant information, however we consent people, however whatever the analysis is, is going to land in these families, and then they have to live with it for the rest of their lives mm -hmm. and subsequent generations. So really it's a reflection rather than a question, but I'd welcome your comments. Right. We only see them in the clinic, and that's the... I don't want it back. <laughs> I already got one. Uh, it's... 
it's, yeah, you see them for this hour or two, maybe, of their life, and then they go out and they have to live that life. And you know, we want them to say, OK, that hour or two or whatever that I spent with you or one of your colleagues, that really helped me, either small or big ways, to, to deal with this whole situation. So really, it's still about, yeah, we've got all this bigger picture, but it's really just about people, the person in the room in front of you and their, and their, and their, their family. Yeah, absolutely. And it's easy to lose sight of that with all the gee whiz uh, technology. Not that I have anything against the technology. I'm as much a nerd as anybody else. I love that stuff. But it's really that people interact, and that's why we're all doing what we're doing, I think. This is completely, completely up there, unfair. Yes. Ah, Janine. I fight you, Bob. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> Do you mind if I go first? Sorry. No. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Bob, it's, it's, it's along the same theme. So, in, you were just saying that. Um, uh, genetic, more people, other professionals will be doing genetic counseling. And I think this, this you know, we, we, we talk about this a lot, but we don't really sort of unpick what exactly that means. And I don't, I don't necessarily agree with the statement as made. I think that increasingly pe other health professionals will be doing components of what we historically have done. But to me, that's not the same as saying that they will be doing genetic counseling. But they're going to call it genetic counseling. Sure. So I think to, that's, that's a problem. So therefore, we need to own what it is that we do. I, I do, I, you know, it comes down to what you're saying about genetic counseling does not equal genetic testing. It isn't. So other healthcare providers will be doing genetic testing. Other healthcare providers will be having risk conversations with people. But even that's not genetic counseling. To me, to get to your question, Anna, about what is it that we do, any, any monkey can give somebody genetic information. And we know that it's not worth a damn. It doesn't help anything in terms of behavior change and Although so on. People want it. Of it's sure. The, it's the of least course. important thing ultimately to them, right? For sure. But you know, if we want to talk about economic outcomes and so on, like so what we do is we, we put the counseling in genetic counseling. So and it's just reinforcing your point, really, is what I'm trying to do here, Bob. Um, so 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 we we're putting the counseling in genetic counseling. Any monkey can give somebody the information, but we make it useful and meaningful in such a way that people can can really do something with it. Um, but we don't have the data yet to we're fully there. back that we're up getting there. all the time. That's, yeah. what, that's what this yeah. conference is supposed totally. to inspire. Yeah. Boy, these lights are shining in my eyes. It's like, it's like I have to tell the truth or something. It's really hard. <laughs> Barb. So Barb B. Secker from the NIH. Um, I, I think it was good Janine went first because um, I want to sort of build on this same theme. I think having just gone um, to the NSGC meeting, which was huge, um, many thousands of genetic counselors and saw the prevalence of the technologies and the number of people who are working with healthy patients who may be at risk. Um, and I do currently, to expose one of my biases, and I have many, I'm currently doing research with, with a lot of individuals who are generally healthy, interested in genetic information about their potential health risks. I worry a lot that in that context, Janine knows that the thing I care most about is what she just described, is um, a lot of the listening to people's experiences, I think, happened in, um, and it may be why a lot of the studies are done in, in Huntington's disease, were done listening to families with children with developmental disabilities and syndromes and affected adults. And they were experts because they live with these things and we help them identify self-made resources to you know, continue to do that to the best of their ability. And that is so diluted now. I mean, there was hardly a sniff of that at the entire, it was an excellent NSGC meeting, but there was hardly a sniff of that. And it, it seems that the overall, I want other people to respond to this, the, the overall background is now we're taking care of healthy people who have these questions, and that bleeds right over into what you just described, Janine. And so I think hanging on to this substance of what genetic counseling is at its very core, and this is a huge issue for training programs, because in the US, we've sort of bound together as training program directors and agreed to continue to teach that model, but is that still the current model, and is it dissolving away? Um, I don't want to be cynical about it, because I sure hope it's not, but it, it really seemed very um, distant at the conference. So let me toss this out back. I, I, when I came in today, there were three delightful young genetic counseling students from the new program in Scotland. Are you here? Or did you run away? Oh, after you met me, did you run away? So do we sound like a bunch of old farts talking about something that ain't relevant anymore? Or do you think this is something that is important to you guys? 
Sorry to put you on the spot, but you know. oh, pointing at each other, you do it, you do it. <laughs> I don't speak English so good. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, do you think what well, our concerns about, this, about the, uh, the, the counseling aspect of gender counseling right. are misplaced? Do you well, think that it, sh it should still be part of practice? And you actually can answer this question better than I can because you're <laughs> taking over the field. Right, because I think for us going into this as well now, um, seeing you know, how things are changing and how things, I think for us at the moment, we, we feel that um, what we're learning now, I mean, it is changing and it's, it's something that like obviously technology is taking over as well but also it's like for us learning the basic aspects of it plays such a big role in trying to determine um, whether technology should take over that or you know like as we see like we've been sitting in a few clinics now I mean we've just started off but seeing you know that most of the people are healthy individuals that come in and just want to know what mm -hmm. the risks what are. What should I be worried for? Or, yeah hardly I mean, I've not yet seen the people that are, okay, so this is what I have, but now what? So I think it is people, the perception that it's more of, okay, um, what are my risks? What's, so you, you think know, patients are presuming, presuming it that way. You as a counselor, though, are you feel like that counseling is still being ingrained into your training and that it's an important part of the interaction with the patient? Absolutely. I think um, the whole counseling aspect of it was the Good, your program director just said, we're <laughs> here. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the like the beginning for a course that was one of the main areas that we were sort of enlightened with. That's something that we focused on entirely, just you know empowerment and effective listening. And so I think it is a big role. I think it's still there. I think it depends on like how you as an individual would take that, mm -hmm. or how you as a counselor would put put that into your practice. I think. Um, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> you did a pretty good job. I'm impressed. Sorry to put you young people on the spot, but hey, I'm in charge up here and you're the students, you gotta listen. <laughs> More T questions. There's Tina yes. there. Hi, I'm Tina Bessels, I'm genetic counselor and course coordinator at UCT in Cape Town in South Africa. Um, I am a practicing genetic counselor, so the patients, I have to say, is also my first passion. I also sort of dabble in research. Um, but for me, I've been also struggling with the uh, empathy and um, in the research that I've done for my PhD a while ago, has, there's something about a moment, which Simo Kessler also spoke about, that critical moment. There's something about that critical moment which has to do with the empathy. And I think if we can try and measure or find how we grab that critical moment, that may be more the success of the session than any of these outcomes. So during that, that session, there's this one kind of moment where you can, there, we can really have an impact. It makes may not be major, it could it be minor, but if that, and so if you don't have the counseling skills, you're not going to be able to capitalize mm -hmm. on that It moment. makes it or it breaks it, and it's, it's like there may be a little bit of sort of fewer, smaller, maybe sort of testing the water, we have it, we don't, we connect, we don't, we do, mm -hmm. and then there's that one moment. Right. If I think if we can just research that, find it, would be very helpful if people can, yes. if we can do that. Yeah, and we can also show to the rest of the world, this is another reason why we do genetic counseling, not exactly. just talk about risks and genetic Because testing. that's, I think that is what separates us from the um, genetic information and um, risk discussions and these are your test options. It's about that, what does this mean for me and mm. what can I do for this? Right. Whether they do it or they don't do it, I suppose it's less important than the fact that there was this person who listened to me that understood, that helped me in some way. So how do you think, now we're looking at this though in the old traditional way of a specific genetic disease a family's at risk for, but now what we're gonna deal with in the future are people who say, oh, I'll get the 23andMe test, which we know, okay, clinically is somewhat useless, but over time there will be direct consumer tests for people who are perfectly healthy with no particular risk so do you think that the counseling skill will still be important for those yes, people? Yes, I think definitely. It's just what they do with it. Right, so whether, mostly post-test rather mm. than pre-test, right? We're not going to help them decide should they have that spit mm. test, mm. but rather, okay, well. People use so many things to make their decision mm -hmm. that if you think that you're the only and the be-all and right. end-all yeah. of helping them, right. you're making a big mistake. Right. Absolutely. You play a small role, I suppose. Right. But for it's some patients, we play a big important. role. For some patients, we play a small role. Absolutely. But at least we play some role. 
So we, we do play an important role, <laughs> the most important one because we're connecting. But whether they're deciding whether they want to have a prenatal test or a Huntington's or whether they should do a 23andMe test, it's still that uncertainty whether I should or I shouldn't, mm. does it make sense or not, we still do that. So the content changes, but the process, I don't think, has changed, changed. or will change yeah. that much. So you're kind of agreeing that the counseling skill is important. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Pat, Chris, you have something to say? No, I'm going to wind this up. Oh, good, that's it. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. I went over, sorry. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bob. Thank you so much. <laughs>